Hi, welcome to the Echo Podcast, where we discuss how our hearts and minds can be an echo of God's heart and mind and what that even means in this world. We're Pastor Dan Sincorn and Adrian Tarullo from Shiloh Church of Jasper, Indiana, and we've gone pulpit to podcast. We hope you enjoy today's episode, which I predict might include some things like prayer, Paul, and pride. <laughs> hmm. That's my uh, guess based on listening to those sermons. So I'll go where you lead me. Awesome. Um, so another two great ones over the past couple weeks. Um, I actually listened to them right before this just to get a refresher. And I tell you what, I, I think I got more from just listening to them again than like the first time around, which I say that with surprise in my voice, but like that makes sense, right? You hear yeah. something twice, you get more from it. Yeah. So listener, if you're not doing that, I highly encourage you to. Um, I got a lot from them the second time a lot more um, like life application type stuff so excited to dig into this with you today pastor d so well i'm genuinely humbled by your words um it's all i want from the preaching is to just be an instrument of god's grace and word but when people tell me it happens i'm a little overwhelmed really really you know it just yeah, cause, because my instinct is both appropriate and inappropriately to just be as surprised as anybody that I could be that effective, you know? Mm. I'm, I'm surprised in one sense because I have my own set of adverse childhood experiences and things that made me, you know, doubt myself. And then in the other sense, um, people often tell me that they hear more than what I said, which is really a sign that the Lord's doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. I think that state of humility is a good place to jump off of when we're talking about prayer, too. Yeah, um, yeah. Just being like a humble servant of God, being a humble person, I think is so honestly countercultural. In our world today um you were talking in your sermon about this like sense of entitlement that we have in this pride and and these are my words now but i'm thinking about how much that can separate us from god Mm -hmm. and so you talked about how we should pray we're talking about prayer and you gave a great like i guess like an overarching summary i guess or overarching um guidelines i guess for how Mm -hmm. to pray and how not to pray um something that stuck with me is that you talked about how prayer is both like sending and receiving these you talked about the radio station and transmitting the signals um but if you're if you're tuned into that same signal you can send and receive which is how our prayer should be with god um John Seger actually said once in youth group, and this really stuck with me too, but it goes right along with this sermon, um, is that God is not a cosmic vending machine. Right. It's not transactional. Like, right. I'm going to put in my quarter and I'll get a soda that comes out. You know, that would be like, God, help me do this. Help me do that. Like, mm-hmm. like it's somehow your will that he's supposed to fulfill. And that's totally the opposite of how it should be. Um, we got to be humble and realize that it's God's will that we're asking for him to do in our lives. And, and basically when I pray, it's like, I'm asking him to not let me get in the way of what he wants to do or like his will as if I have that kind of power or authority. But I guess it's just a way of like humility of saying, don't let my will overpower your will. Um, and so I don't know if you have any thoughts after all of that. Um, <laughs> well, you know, too many. Um, yeah, sure. But but I I was just thinking as you said all that, like how would I sum that up? And I think the most important thing that people need to keep in mind, and, and I fear that many just don't, um, either because they, well, I should say what it is and then talk about why I don't think they do it. Otherwise, I'm not making a very good sentence. <laughs> so what I think people need to keep in mind is, is that that we are 
we're we're sort of deposited into this world you know we we are the product of parents who came together and created a little person called you or me and you grow up with whatever you get you grow up in poverty you grow up in wealth you grow up in a foreign country uh which which they all are right that was a dumb thing to say you grow up you grow up in a in a third world country or you grow up in a first world country you know you you grow up uh, black or you grow up grow up green or you grow up blue or you grow up brown or you grow up white you know you grow up with black hair red hair yellow hair you know I, I mean you you didn't have anything to say about any of that but for some reason as we go through life we start thinking that we are in control somehow or that we have more to say about our situation than we really do um, Granted, when you get to a certain age, say two, three years old, you know, you start thinking for yourself. And even though it's rudimentary, you, you think it for yourself and you realize you don't have to do what your parents tell you. That sometimes they don't even know when you've defied them, you know, that you've actually pulled one over on them. And, and you know, so this sort of sin nature starts to have its place in your life. But it seems to evolve unchecked anyway into a just all out rebellion against God. And this is where I was trying to find my words before I started talking and then I started talking anyway. <laughs> I was I was trying to figure out how you say this, that that it's easy to forget that in a way you're a guest in God's world <laughs> you know like like you are you are here going through life and you can try to go through it without God or you can try to go through it with God but either way you go through it mm -hmm. and and if you do it without God then who do you have to blame for what you don't like about the world apart from you are the people you think have hurt you somehow you know you can blame politics you can blame uh governments you can blame teachers you can blame you know uh people in authority over you you can blame all kinds of things for what you don't like about life but it's the life you got when you start involving god in the process the first thing you have to do that we never seem to do is acknowledge that God is superior, that God is above and beyond all of this in a way that justifies why we call him God. Meaning that if you want to act like God owes you something, then you don't really understand what, what it means to be God. Because the very fact that God is God and I am not means God doesn't owe me anything, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm, I'm trying to pull this together without having thought it through ahead of time. But my, my meaning is, is that, that we, we have this distorted view of our relationship with God. And we have this distorted view of ourselves that is a product of natural sin. We have a tendency to think way too much of ourselves and way too little of God. When in fact, we would do better to think way too much of God and not so much of ourselves. But that, that just violates this core thing in us that informs us that we have sacred worth and that we are entitled to certain degree of, of self-respect and self-esteem and all of this kind of stuff. And that really taints the conversation between us and God. You know, um, I think my favorite, one of my favorite lines from the sermon and, and I got to tell you, you know, I, the lines that I usually like best from the sermons are the ones I make up on the fly. Like, like when I'm talking, um, an idea will just pop into my head and I'll say it and it really isn't in the notes or anything. And this was one of them. I said, thanks to Jesus Christ, 
you are invited into a place where you don't belong. You know, you are invited into a place where you don't belong, which is to sit at God's kitchen table and tell him all about your troubles. You know, yeah. I mean, you're not allowed there. You're not welcome there. You know, most of us can relate to this. Um, if you've ever been by a military installation or a piece of government property and it's got signs and it's got high fences and it says no trespassing, violators will be prosecuted. Don't go in here. You could be shot, you know, and and that's what it's like for us in relation to God. And I know people who push back when I say things like this because they need for God to be this loving father and all of this. And the truth is, God is all of that. But God isn't all of that until we come to him in humility and plead mercy through Jesus Christ. In other words, you need to recognize that there is a dangerous nature to our relationship with God until we come into his grace. C.S. Lewis meant for us to see it through the character of Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and, and the entire Chronicles of Narnia. He wanted us to understand that Aslan is this dangerous, ferocious lion, but he is also this benevolent, gentle king. And if you're in his favor, then you have this powerful ally this powerful protector and provider. And if you are outside of his favor, he will devour you. He will destroy you. And that's exactly what C.S. Lewis says about the character of Aslan. He's, he spoke a lot about that. And he said that he meant for us to interpret God as both a very dangerous, scary being, but also a very loving and benevolent and generous, grace-filled being. It all depends on how you approach him, you know, and, and it doesn't mean that God's precocious or that God is uh, uh, somehow fickle or anything like that. It's not that complicated. If you approach him with humility because you recognize your place in his creation and you recognize and, and the truth that you have to be able to rep recognize is that God this is again, I cry. hey, everybody, if you haven't watched The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe movie lately, go watch it. This Didn't we do this once before? I swear we had a podcast where I gave the exact same advice, and then I went home and watched it. Cause, because oh. it's, like, it's like this movie and this story written by Jack Lewis was, was really a brilliant way to express it, and the movie was made really well, so you could walk away having... A clear understanding of this is he wants you to be princes and princesses and rulers in his kingdom he wants to elevate you to equality with his son in esteem from the heavenly father but he also has every intention of destroying you if you will not submit Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that plain. So when you were talking earlier about how, like, we're not welcome at the table or like, well, no, you didn't say then it like that. Don't belong. Don't belong. Yes. Like, like in his presence. Um, I guess that's what you meant then, right? I think I know where you're going, but I just want to make sure like listeners are on right, the same page. Right. Like God wants you there. He wants to be in your presence. But I think recognizing his almighty power is it puts it into perspective of, of like, I don't belong here. Right. And my brain goes to the old Testament. Um, when characters like Moses and, and all of the people yes. in his time and throughout really the entire old Testament up through like when Jesus was born and alive, they had to go through this purification process before entering into God's presence. Yes. Like they had to bathe, they had to wash their clothes, they had to put animal blood on them and, you know, right earlobe, right thumb, right toe. Like there was this whole thing of this process that God laid out that said, 
this is what you need to do in order to be pure in my presence. And only a few select people could actually be in his presence. So there was this, there was this seriousness and gravity that these people would take when they approached the presence of God, the almighty, like in his temple, in his most holy of holy place. Of course, that was when the temple was built. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's, kind of what popped in my mind when you were talking about this in the sermon, like how we should approach God. And I think that's, that's the beauty of Jesus. And that's the beauty of a savior is that we can just fold our hand, close our eyes and we're, 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 we're pure. Like we don't have to go through all of these things. Um, there's no risk of, well, probably minimal risk of us being like smited, right? Like they used to be in the old Testament when they, when they didn't follow these purification rules. And so, um, is that kind of what you meant when you said that we don't belong in God's presence or were you thinking of something else? No, that's it. See, and, and I, I appreciate you fleshing that out because I don't want anybody to go away from listening to me, especially with the, with an incomplete picture here that what I'm doing in too few words which is an ironic thing for me to say (laughs) but but what i'm saying in 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 my own way is just that the bible makes it pretty clear if you look at the entire bible it makes it pretty clear that god has a particular interest in the children of adam that he created for a very special relationship with his son and yet sin and the influence of the devil corrupted the people who were the sons of Adam and daughters of Adam, meaning that they were rendered unclean or unfit to be in the same room with his son, with him, with God the Father, right? And so God has this passionate interest in these people that he created for this special purpose. And his son is all the more passionate about the father And so for the sake of the father, the son's willing to do whatever it takes to redeem these people. And for the sake of the son, the father really wants to redeem these people for the son. (laughs) I mean, it's like love on such an exponential scale, we can't even comprehend it. We can't find adequate words for it. And yet, while we were separated from God because of sin, God kept creating ways for us to safely enter into communion with him, which you just described. He kept saying, okay, look, I don't want to give up on this relationship. My son doesn't want me to give up on this relationship. So I'm going to invite you into my presence, but it's going to have to be done very carefully because my holiness is more than you can stand. And Moses is my friend and it's more than he can stand. I had to hide him in the cleft of the rock and he still got a holy suntan, right? You know, so, so that's kind of how it was. And then Jesus comes and Jesus through the cross redeems us and makes us, he, he basically stands before us when we stand in the presence of God. So when God looks toward us, he sees the sun, but something happens then when he you know when jesus is standing before the father and he says okay now come on it's okay you can come out now and you come out from behind him and god sees you and he just glows with delight because you came with jesus right and 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 it's like he doesn't see you the sinner anymore he sees you the son or daughter of god he sees the sons of adam that he always wanted us to be the sons and daughters of Adam. So this is this is the story of the transition. The thing that Christians routinely forget, especially if they were raised in a religion or raised in church, is they forget that you still have to be purified. You still have to go through the purification process. It's just that now you don't do it through a series of rules and regulations and mikvahs and things like that. You do it by accepting Christ as your savior and Lord. You do it by entering into God's presence with Jesus, even behind Jesus. And this is where I think most people miss the mark. 
they assume that believing in Jesus, which I don't mean any condescension or disrespect, but so many people say they believe in Jesus in the same way they used to say they believed in Santa Claus. So many people say they believe in Jesus in the same way they say they believe in, in you know, all sorts of things that can't, you know, they can't necessarily prove. They just enjoy believing it. They enjoy the benefits of believing it. And believing it isn't what saves you. Believing in Jesus doesn't save you. The Bible says even Satan believes in Jesus. You know, yeah. there's no problem there. In fact, Satan believes in Jesus in some ways better than most people who claim they believe in Jesus. Because Satan believes in him to the extent that he knows that his existence will come to an end because of who Jesus is. So when I say that people are invited to enter a place where they don't belong, I mean that they're not worthy to be in the presence of God until Christ himself makes them worthy. And Christ can't make you worthy until you submit to him and admit that you're not worthy. Like, like it really comes down to that, that, that um, you know, most of us have never humbled ourselves to the extent that we acknowledge that we are, we are done. You know, we're finished. We are nothing until we come into our relationship with Christ. Our life, this thing we were deposited into, with all that stuff I said at the beginning, you know, all of that is meaningless without Christ because it means that you'll be here for a little while. This is what Solomon meant when he was writing things like, you know, the grass withers and blows away and to dust we will return. I just did a funeral this week and I say, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, because that's all we are. That's all we are without Jesus. And, most of us just never realize how important it is to acknowledge that. And most of us even find it threatening for someone like me to come along and tell you, you have to do that because whether they're aware of it or not, that's their pride talking. Their pride is telling them that if you keep saying that the only way I can enter into God's grace is through repentance, then it means that there's something wrong with me. It means that I'm not good enough. It means that, that I'm a sinner. And, and you know what? The answer is right. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the problem. Is, is we are so conditioned, especially in America, to think that we're supposed to esteem ourselves. You know, I've talked about this before, and this one is... This is a lesson that really struck home a few years ago when I realized the vast difference between self-esteem and self-respect. Self-respect is a good thing. Self-respect says, I don't need to beat up on myself. In fact, I shouldn't. There are things that I say to myself that I wouldn't say to you because I respect you. Then why do I say them to myself if not because I don't respect me? So the self-talk that drives us backward and, and, and forces us to be less than we are capable of, that is a matter of self-respect. And so I encourage everybody to crank up their self-respect, but do not fall into that dangerous territory of self-esteem because self-esteem is, is evaluating yourself un, un, unduly you know, having a high opinion of yourself. There's a difference. Self-respect is a humble thing. It really is. It's hum humility gives you self-respect. But pride gives you self-esteem. And so you have to really recognize the danger of self-esteem, of being, of being so full of yourself that you can't admit that you might be better than, you know, look, I get it. You, you may be a person who grew up with, with bad experiences and things, and you might say, well, you know, please, 
I can't handle it. Nobody tell me that I'm not a good person because if I'm not, then I'm as bad as the person who abused me all through my childhood, right? I get that, right? I really do. But we're talking about your relationship with Christ, not your relationship with other people. And so we're back to that where you belong and where you don't belong thing. Because that's what I was getting at in the sermon is, is like, you, you know, and even in the one from, from the Romans 5, you know, it, both were basically um, the general theme was is that if you want to experience the fullness of God's grace and have peace with God, you have to acknowledge the vast difference between you and God. I didn't say the vast difference between you and other people. I didn't say the vast difference between you and the boss that berates you and puts you down or the spouse that abuses you or the parent that abuses you. I didn't say any of that. I, those are different things. In order to have a healthy relationship with God, you have to humble yourself before God and you have to remember that God never does anything unjust or evil. Otherwise, it wouldn't be much of a God which means you can't equate your relationship with God with your relationships with other people. But we are kind of predisposed to try to put God in a package that looks like somebody. But God created all the somebodies. God isn't one of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And... I can see how someone listening might struggle with the idea that um, they're not worthy or like they're not good innately, right? Like that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. But something that I was thinking and reflecting on as you were talking is we should ask ourselves, have we never sinned? And and forget sin. If you're a non-Christian listening to this, forget sin. Have you never hurt somebody? Mm-hmm. Whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, have you never caused harm in any way? Have you lived your life in a perfect way, whatever that is? I don't think perfect is real, except for God. He's perfect. Um, But it's like, I mean, I try to live my life in this way, and yet I can count on one hand at least the number of times that I've hurt somebody. Didn't mean to, but it's just we're broken people. We're living in a broken world. Yeah. It happens. And so, you know, there's, I mean, the youth group, we've been studying the Old Testament all year. I mean, we're almost done. We're almost through it. And so that's just always kind of on the front of my mind. But I think about all these stories of these characters who have at least been in the slightest presence of God, like Moses, Mm -hmm. Ezekiel, um, all of these people, and they just like fall face first to the ground Mm -hmm. and they're just eating the sand because they're like i am so not worthy to be in your presence and i think that's the mentality that we should we should address god with Mm -hmm. um you know when we get to the pearly gates like you were talking about and and someone whoever it is ask us why should why should i let you in your response should not be because jesus thinks i'm awesome yeah because i'm awesome like that's so prideful right like that should not be i forgot i said that 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 was pretty good that's really good yeah (laughs) well this guy jesus you know my homie he says i'm awesome so you should let me in he would flick you down (laughs) faster than the potency in that joke that was another one of those just off the top of my head moments but the potency in that joke is, is that i believe people really feel that way yeah. That I believe that I was talking to people that day who, if they really think about it, that's how they feel. Now, not that was an exaggeration to make a point, but they essentially assume that they are good because Jesus says so. And therefore, why am I even listening to this guy? Why am I listening to this? What, is, what does he think is wrong with me? You know, why did, why is he beating me over the head with this? That was kind of the point of the joke mm-hmm. is, is if you were standing or if you're sitting in the pew listening to me as I stand up there telling you this and you're kind of thinking, I wish he'd get off this hellfire and brimstone stuff. I wish he'd stop, you know, condemning me. I feel bad when he talks like that. And, and that's the one I'm saying 
because you think you've already done everything you're supposed to do in order to win God's approval and get into heaven. And you are in effect like the person that says, well, you see God, you should let me in because I'm awesome. And the reason I know I'm awesome is because I believe in Jesus. And, you know, to which God would say, yeah, so does Satan. You don't see him around here anywhere. He you thinks know. he's awesome too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the point, right? Like, like I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but the truth in love that's so critically important these days is that there are so many people who go to church who aren't saved. They're really not. And, and it breaks my heart because I'm no superior to them. I, I don't deserve to be in this position making this proclamation. You know, who am I except another person who was dirt that got lifted up by Christ, dusted off and said, I want you in my heaven with me. And because you understand that you don't belong there, you're ready to receive my grace and come in. You know, that's all I am. And that's all that people have to be if they want to get that place too, if they want to be in that place. But so many of them are just blissfully ignorant because they can't get around the idea that they think they're good. And that's because they keep comparing themselves to the world around them. And that's my point. I think, I think I've probably been kind of redundant up to this point in answering your question, but but my point is, is that we keep comparing ourselves to the wrong person. You know, we, we keep saying that we deserve God's favor. We deserve for God to answer our prayers, by the way, the way we configure them. <laughs> we, we are entitled to God's favor. And all of this, because I've gone to church all my life, I've always said that I believe in Jesus to all the other people who say they believe in Jesus. But when it's all said and done, to what extent has this changed your life? To what extent has this driven you to your knees? You know, um, it's a theme that comes up in the movies and books and literature and various other forms of drama. There will be people who come to a point when they know that they are more desperate than they've ever been in their entire life. And at that moment, they're willing to do whatever it takes just to survive, just to, like, like, see, that's the thing, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have things that they worked really hard to get because they were willing to do whatever it takes. But what I'm talking about is people who are on the brink of destruction. And at that moment, they realize that they're desperate enough to do even things that they considered unthinkable in order to be restored, in order to, to be saved you know and most people just never have to deal with that most people never end up dealing with these kinds of decisions but to enter into God's favor requires all of us to have a moment like that and I know some people like me kind of gradually come to it and I'm really grateful that I didn't have a moment in my life where I just slammed up against the wall and then had to admit that I was nothing and I had to, you know, start over pleading for God's mercy. I never had to do that. When the story tour comes this Saturday, you're going to see a lot of people who are there. Yeah. And you're going to hear a lot of stories about people who are there. But for a lot of us, we grow up in the faith and it's just, it's, it's just like we, we are so close, you know, like, like what Jesus said to Nicodemus in the Bible when he says, you are very close to the kingdom of God. You know, you, you just almost got this, but the one thing you lack, you know, and then he tells him. He says it to the, the rich young fool, you know, the one thing you lack is you just can't imagine life without all your stuff, you know, and, and I've often thought that Jesus isn't literally calling all of us to a life of literal poverty. He's asking us to have a poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning that none of your possessions possess you. 
-hmm. that if Jesus says, follow me, you say, okay, and you go. And that's, again, what this is about. It's, it's like the prayer of the faithful is a prayer of the one who says, not my will, but yours be done. The prayer of the faithful is the one that says, thanks for all the great stuff and all the fun people and all the great food. And, you know, thanks for putting me in a place that's easy to live in. And thank you for all of that. And then one day he says, I need you to go with me. And you say, okay. <laughs> that's what I'm really talking about. Some people don't necessarily have to go to that point of saying, oh my gosh, I'm a desperate sinner and I'm destined for hell and I'm just really starting to understand that. Some people don't need to go there, but we all need to go to that place where we recognize that he may ask us at any moment to step into a place of discomfort for his name's sake. And the discomfort could be, go ahead, pray whatever you want to pray, but don't be mad at me if the answer isn't the one you were hoping for. Follow me anyway. You know? Yeah. Um, I remember a story. This is a real stretch, but but it just came to mind. I remember a story that Ellie Wiesel tells. You know, he was a Holocaust survival author, a survivor author who wrote Night and a lot of other really well-known books about the Holocaust. And he told this story about how the Jews, uh, this Orthodox Jewish community was condemned and they were all in this prison camp and and the people said to their elders, you know, is God just? I mean, how could God be just if this is happening to us? And so the elders decided to have a trial and they put God on trial. And one acted as the prosecutor and one acted as the defendant. And a group of rabbis acted as the judges. And when it was all over, the elder judge said, well, you've made a good case. And the answer is God is unjust. And he, you know, slams the gavel, so to speak. And then he says, now let's go worship. Hmm. And that was an Ellie Wiesel story. And, and all it really means is, is, you know what? Sometimes God seems unjust. Worship him anyway. And you don't have to be Jewish. You can be a Christian and, and you can work that angle. That's not, a, that's not a unique point of view that's only Old Testament. That's the way it is for all of us. The people who pray, and this is the spirit of what I was trying to say, Pat, this last Sunday, is the people who pray with a sense of entitlement expect God to be just according to their particular view of that. And, and the longer I live and the older I get, the more I realize that people's points of view are really narrow, that, that no matter how worldly you are, you know, I'd like to think I'm a pretty worldly guy and I've been a lot of places and seen a lot of things and I can do some pretty heavy duty critical thinking. But you know what? What I think I know about how the world looks through other people's eyes, man, you could put that in a thimble. You know, it's it's like like, man, you know, there are people all over this world and people who have lived for generations and generations, you know, who who have a totally different worldview than I do. And that, well, I don't want to go there, but some of these discussions that have been happening in the last 15, 20 years in America about, you know, Civil War reparations and slavery and, and, and stuff like that, one of the things that's really wrong about that is, is that people are assuming that what looks right to them today would have looked right 200 years ago. Which isn't to say that those people should have done what they did or shouldn't have done what they did, but you're not giving them the benefit of their context. You're not giving them the freedom to live and function within the world as it was for them in that day. Which doesn't mean that some things should have been permissible. It just means that under the circumstances, it was a lot harder to change. And so change takes time. And, and that's just a side thing. But, but what it comes back to is, is that the humility says, I don't know everything. Humility says, what I know about other people's worldview is something you could put in a thimble. That's humility. Humility says, God, I don't really understand very much about you at all. And I am absolutely blown away that you have revealed as much as you have. I'm absolutely 
stunned that you would invite me to seek you and discover you and understand and know you better every day and then invite me to spend the rest of eternity cultivating that relationship. I mean, that's humility. And, and my, my big premise for Sunday was don't pray any other way because when you do, then you're just treating God like a genie or a cosmic vending machine. And, and you know, I like that you use that phrase. This is another one of my favorites. Um, I actually had a little sort of a, a YouTube short that's, that I put out that's got a lot of hits. And it's because of, it's the place where I said, you know, when I was a kid, it cost a dime to make a phone call on a public telephone. You know, we didn't have cell phones and all that. And so you paid a dime and then it got up to a quarter and it was a nickel before it was a dime. But anyway, somebody would say, you know, hey, I need to talk to you. And the really standard response was, okay, it's your dime. You know, saying you place the call, I'll listen. And what I said the, uh, the other day was, is except for one time, when you reach out to God, it's always his dime, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm really just trying to say it's always God's prerogative. It's never yours. You know, you, you can talk to God and he's always glad to hear from you and he's always glad to converse with you. But you need to understand that no matter how you approach him, it's always God's prerogative. It's always his precepts it's it's always god's you know which which again it, it it's not that i want people to fear god or feel like god doesn't invite them to this parental loving relationship but even in a relationship with your parent you may find yourself as a small child approaching your parent with more fear some days than others because you just broke something and you're going to your parent afraid of a punishment that you kind of know you deserve. So you go to them with humility and you go, I, I broke your thing, you know. And then the loving parent says, it's okay, accidents happen. You have small hands and they just don't hold things as tightly as big hands. And then you get grace, you know. And there are other times when you're defiant and you're staring your parent down and asking them to repent of, being such you know bossy people and everything and that's when the parent has to go i really love you but right now i need to straighten you out mm -hmm. right and this is the way it is with our relationship with god he's going to hear you sometimes and say i love you but you are so off your rocker right now you know you need you need to stop and think about what you just said to me you need to stop and think about what you want and why you want it so that was the whole premise. Yeah. And I love that we're flushing through or flushing out like how not to pray in a way, yeah. like how not to approach God, because I find that that's probably a little bit easier than saying how you should pray because there's, I don't know, I think about like physical therapy. If you're trying to accomplish the goal of getting someone better and out of pain, like there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. There's this exercise and that exercise and that manual technique and whatever. And kind of the same is with prayer. As long mm -hmm. as your heart and mind are in it for the right thing and you're in the right headspace, I mean, there's not really like a way to pray like this is how you should pray, you know? So like, I don't know. It kind of well, gets... Well, I have good news because this coming Sunday, I'm going to teach about how Jesus taught us to pray. Well, the Lord's Prayer, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, but, you know, and and I know you've been binging, you know, the last couple of sermons and things. But what's coming is, is that I'm going to make the case for, you know, yeah, I'm proud of you. You memorize the Lord's Prayer, but you also treat it like a ritual rather than a form of prayer. And it turns out Jesus was actually giving you a model for prayer. And so we're going to spend our time Sunday talking about how the model works. And, and when I leave, when you leave Sunday morning, hopefully you'll be equipped to pray the Lord's Prayer in about a half an hour or so. Oh, wow. So that you can really have a conversation with God. So, which isn't taken away from anything you just said, you know, everything you just said is right. But the, the fact is, Jesus did give us a way. In fact, here, here's a spoiler. In the message Sunday, I plan on telling people that they should make 
note of the fact that this is one of the rare occasions in the New Testament where Jesus gives a direct answer. You know, an awful lot of the time when they ask Jesus questions, he gives not mysterious answers, but answers that we're still trying to sort out sometimes, you know. But this was a case where he gave a very direct answer. They said, how should we pray? And he said, not like those guys. Rather, pray like this. And then he gave the answer. And we should take that to heart. We should understand that. You know, not, not that we should repeat his words verbatim. And, well, you know, when we went to Israel, I think I have a card over there somewhere. But anyway, when we go to Israel, there's this one place that we visit that is that is Arab Christians and one of them will invariably get on the bus right before we go to visit with them in their shop and will recite the Lord's Prayer to us in Aramaic which was the language Jesus would have used at the actual moment when he taught them how to pray and it's really beautiful to listen to it in Aramaic Wow! you know and and to just recognize that you know it's very natural to uh, speak to God like that, you know, that Jesus is saying, well, this is how I pray, <laughs> you know, anyway. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Love it. Um, I think one thing that I can pretty confidently say is that prayer should not be just rote and mindless. Like if you just have the Lord's Prayer memorized and you say that every day, don't just check that box. Like, that's not what God wants, right? Yeah, and you know what? I just thought of something. Um, the uh, the young adult lounge group that you launched a while back, um, I was informed that they had some discussion about that and that I kind of supported an unpopular point of view in the sermon um, because there's a temptation for some Christians to think that written prayers and reciting published prayers like from liturgies or prayer books or something, there's a temptation for people to think there's something wrong and disingenuous about that. And I had said at the beginning of the sermon, no, no, there's nothing wrong with that. It has everything to do with how you pray. And in fact, as a pastor, there have been times when I've been asked to prepare a prayer for a special occasion, and I wrote it ahead of time. But when I got up and prayed it, there was no question that what I was praying was as real as it gets. And there are two responses to that. Number one is, is give God a little credit. <laughs> he could be there in the writing, and he can be there in the reading. <laughs> and, yeah. you know... And it's kind of like a greeting card, right? How many people have gotten greeting cards that had really beautiful sentiments on it? And they said, yeah, it's too bad it's store-bought, and they just chucked it. When I read a greeting card, I imagine the person has taken time. I've watched people. You have too. You go to the store where those greeting cards are and people are standing there for 15, 20, 30 minutes. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Looking through the greeting cards, finding the one that says exactly what they want to tell the person mm -hmm. who's going to receive it. Can we not have the same approach to a written prayer? Someone really carefully crafted this prayer to say something that now speaks to my soul so now I want to pray this prayer in that spirit. And which is actually what I'm going to do on Sunday is to say, I'm not faulting you for having the Lord's Prayer memorized. I'm faulting you for saying it without meaning. That's the difference. Yeah. You can recite a prayer that you know by heart, but when you say it, do you say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come on the earth as in the heaven, and the kingdom is there, trespasses, amen. Right? Because... That's one thing. On the other hand, if you say, oh, Father, I'm, I'm blown away that you, the king of heaven and earth and all of creation, that you actually want to talk to me for a minute. You actually have a moment of your time for me. <laughs> you stepped out of time in order, out of timelessness in order to enter my time 
to spend time with me. Hallowed be thy name. I mean, so that, that's all the difference right there. You know, it's just a question of how you pray. And if you don't know what to pray, it's okay. I put a prayer in the newsletter for this coming Sunday about the Global Methodist Church General Conference. And it says, not sure how to pray? Here's a suggestion. Well, you can read it and your cat might not be impressed because you didn't say it with any feeling. On the other hand, you could pray it like you mean it and your cat could say, oh, I didn't know I was such a good cat. I had no idea you loved me so much. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because I know you're a cat owner. Yes, but I think there's a disclaimer here. Don't pray to your cat. Right, but what is the difference? It's the tone. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Your animals don't pay any attention to the tone of your voice unless it reflects an emotion yeah. that they tap into. Well, if that's how animals are, then how do you think God feels? How do you think the person you live with feels? Yeah, I love you too. Honey, you know I love you. It's it's all the difference, right? Yeah. You know, it, it has everything to do with the heart and mind behind the words. So please, please, please don't be one of those people who criticizes written prayers, wrote prayers, that kind of thing. And by wrote, we mean repeated prayers. I do a liturgy for communion every week that is very familiar to Methodists, and it's not that different from the one that you hear in Lutheran and Catholic church. But I have people tell me all the time that when I read the liturgy, they hear it, they get what it says, and they are tempted to laugh sometimes because I'll stop in the middle of the liturgy and I'll say, wait a minute, let's do that line over again. Did you hear what that said? It said, that you promised to be with us in the spirit and the word. Okay, let's keep going, you know. And I do that because it has everything to do with the life you bring to the words. So I say the same liturgy every Sunday for communion, but I try to breathe life into it. And I think that's all I'm getting at. And I probably already talked too long about it, but it's because I want to get people to the point that they're ready for what I want to say about the Lord's Prayer on Sunday. Nothing wrong with memorizing the Lord's Prayer. Good on you. You got one you can always go to. You got, your, you got that one in your hip pocket that's always there when you need it. But when you pray it, don't just recite the words. Actually mean what you're saying. God can tell the difference, just like your cat. <laughs> and that's my point. Yeah. You know, cats are brilliant at being indifferent. And yet you can say, what a pretty kitty. And all of a sudden that tone just draws them like a magnet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just funny, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we should close today with a few remarks on like, if someone's wanting to enhance their prayer life, what yeah. might be a few things that they could pray for? Um, what, sh what could it look like, I guess? Well... Some people thrive on structure and habits, and so make prayer a habit, and yet don't make it so habitual that it has no meaning. You know, um, I don't know how to explain that because it'd be like saying I have coffee with a few of my buddies every Tuesday at seven o'clock in the morning, and we just sit there and drink coffee and don't talk to each other. It'd be like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I never miss a coffee day with my buddies, but basically when we're done drinking, we all go, well, see ya, and we leave. Like, well, okay, I could have stayed home and drank coffee in silence. So don't approach God that way. You know, approach God with a plan to have a conversation. As I said in the sermon, plan to receive way more than you transmit. Um, you know, I used the radio station analogy and as soon as I got home, I asked my family, did that make sense? Because what I was saying was when I worked at a radio station, 
I was young and I was, you know, and, and we lived in a radio culture then, you know, everybody listened to the radio. We didn't have streaming podcasts and all that jazz. We listened to the radio. And when you listen to the radio, it means you find the frequency of the station you want to listen to and you dial it up and, you know, you even had a little push button so you could memorize the location. And, and, and so if you want to listen to the classical music station where I worked, you went to 106.9 and there I was. And if you want to listen to the rock station that was down at 95.5, you went down there and you listened to it. And so it dawned on me one day when I was working at the radio station that I have two receivers sitting on the control board next to me. And one of them's got our station on it. And that's so I can hear what our broadcast sounds like to you at the other end in your car or wherever you're listening. And then I have another receiver that I only occasionally use to listen to a broadcast from a station that was that we simulcast with periodically. And all of a sudden I was thinking, holy smokes. I'm sitting in front of my microphone broadcasting at 106.9 and he's sitting in front of his microphone broadcasting at 95.5. And if I'm listening to 95.5 and he's listening to 106.9, then we are communicating. It's not a one-way conversation, which is what you typically think of radio being. Mm -hmm. You don't talk back to the guy on the radio or the gal on the radio. You just listen. But if it turns out that you're listening to each other broadcast, you're having a conversation. And, and that's why radio is so strictly regulated. <laughs> because you got these 50,000-watt blowtorches that are broadcasting across the continent and theoretically, we could just talk to each other and we could plot the overthrow of the government or something, you know. <laughs> so this was my illustration, and it really is a stretch because this isn't what you asked me for a minute ago. But, but I started thinking about that, so I thought, well, I'm going to risk sharing this with the congregation and see if they get where I'm going. That we have a tendency to think that our conversations are one-way conversations where we've got the microphone and God should just listen. Meanwhile, God's over here on his frequency saying, now you listen to me. <laughs> and uh, then, it, then it occurred to me that back in the old days, like in World War II era, you had to push a button to transmit and you had to let go to receive. Mm. <laughs> and that's actually a way better illustration that if we keep holding the transmit button down, God never gets a word in edgewise. You know, we need to let go of the button and stop talking and listen. You know, uh, it's God's dime. So pray regularly. Start simple. Start with five minutes. But start with humility. Say, Lord, I really knew it this, but I believe you're there. And I believe you are hallowed by, you know, hallowed be thy name. I believe you are big bigger than anybody anything in the world i believe that if you wanted to with the word you could destroy the entire universe just as surely as you could create it with the word so i don't want you to think i don't know who i'm talking to <laughs> and oh by the way thanks for letting me talk to you what an amazing god that's all i got for now god is that okay i love you i'm gonna keep your radio on Got anything to say? I hope I hear it. Amen. I mean, it could be like that. Just try. Yeah. Just try. Yeah. You know, and then the thing I said in the message that I really wish everybody would understand is prayer changes your priorities. When you take time to pray and when you assume that God is always around, always listening, always dialed into your life and asking you to dial into his word, his, his heart and mind, <sighs> it changes your priorities, you know, it changes because, because honestly, most of us suffer from one form of peer pressure or another, and we have a tendency to do what the people around us are doing. And what if we're focused on God, then we're more into what God is doing. Yeah. That would be my first piece of advice for somebody. Don't assume that you need to pray for an hour if that's not something you can do. Don't assume that you have to pray, you know, thee and thou and, you know, stuff like that. Don't be afraid to try a book of prayer. You know, 
um, but make it a challenge to you to be able to recite the prayer like it's your words. You know, read it through once, then read it out loud like you're praying the prayer. Um, I tell people all the time, read the Psalms out loud. They're, it's a prayer book, basically. You know, and if you read something in the Psalms that's unsettling, switch to another one. There's only like a hundred and how many of them, you know, you, I'm a pastor, yeah. I'm a Bible scholar, and I don't remember how many Psalms there are, you know, there's a zillion of them. And, and if you just want to pick one that sounds like something you would say, then go with it. Yeah. A couple other things that I wrote down from your sermon was, um, in prayer, ask for repentance for being overly self-interested. Yeah. I thought that was a really good one. Um, we talked about pride extensively, and um, it's something that we, I think, all fall into that trap of at one point in time or the other. Like, we're very self-interested in what we are doing and what, what is going on in our lives. And so asking for repentance for that because it's a total perspective change. You know, I, I only have one short comment on that is, is that now that you say that, I have heard many great preachers over the years say, pray for repentance literally ask God to give you repentance mm. because it could be that you resist it because there is a real major blockage in there. And it may be that it's a stronghold for the Satan and a stronghold for your pride that God has to break. And so you say, Lord, please grant me repentance. So pray for repentance. That's a brilliant piece of advice. Yeah, that's big. That's big. Um, and then the other one that I wrote down was just pray that you can be an instrument of God's grace and love. Um, that's the whole heart of the thing, right? Like we know that God gave us all these laws that we can't possibly uphold because it's an impossible standard. That's why we need a savior mm -hmm. because we cannot hold uphold the law. We need Jesus. And um, we were talking in youth group about this the other day and I said, well, then why even try? I was kind of questioning them to mm -hmm. see what they would come up with. Why even try? If God gives us an impossible law that we cannot uphold, what's the point? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, I, I don't know. And like the point is so that we can be more like Christ, that we can be Christ's hands and feet to the world to show this world his love, his grace, his mercy. That's the point. Mm -hmm. That's why we keep trying, even though we fall short all the time. Mm -hmm. and You're a good teacher. That, that's good stuff. Adrian's a good teacher, everybody. <laughs> Send your children her way. I trust her. Send your youth her way. I, I love that because it's like words right out of Jesus' mouth. You know, he told people, I say that if you look at somebody with anger, you may as well have murdered them. If you look at someone with lust, you may as well have committed adultery. And, and people are like, this is impossible. And that's the point, really. Yeah. He isn't saying it because he wants you to stop feeling. Well, no, I don't want to say that. He, of course, he wants you to stop feeling anger towards other people. But he's saying as long as you boil with hatred towards another person, it really doesn't matter whether you act on it or not. Your spirit's in danger of sin. You know, and, and that's really it. Like, like you know, and, and so you were asking earlier on, you know, Okay, never mind what you think of sin, you know, don't forget what you call sin or whatever. <laughs> okay, fine. Adrian's right. Don't even use the word sin because we all have a different idea what that means. Have you ever looked at anybody with anger and rage? And if it's even remotely possible that that anger and rage could be translated to enough energy to take another person's life to say this world would be better without you in it. I mean, if you think like that, even a little bit, would you say that makes you someone who needs a little attitude adjustment? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, there are times when I'm so mad at the person that cut me off on the highway that I wish I could run them off and watch their car burst into flames. Okay. And then do you ever stop and think about whose mother that is, whose child that is, whose son or daughter that is? whose aunt or uncle that is, whose teacher that is, whose professor that is, who's about to develop a new cure for cancer or whatever, you know, and then you go, okay, okay, point taken. I didn't really want them to blow up and die. 
I'm just mad at him. All right. You just repented. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, you know, and this is Adrian, by the way. I'm just taking what Adrian said and, <laughs> and expanding on it, right? Yeah. And that's what Jesus means when he says, if you just look at somebody with anger, if you just, just feel anger towards them, then you might as well commit murder. And that's his point. Is because once you get on that slippery slope, you're getting further from God and closer to the heart of Satan. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think that's about all I've got. Yeah, me too. On one hand, I could probably sit here and do this all afternoon, and on the other hand, I just shouldn't. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, everybody. Thanks for listening. See ya. <laughs>